Good. Good afternoon again. Now we have everyone sitting here. Uh, welcome to uh, another daily press briefing from the headquarters of the World Health Organization. Uh, today is the first day of the two, uh, 2019 Novel Coronavirus Global Research and Innovation Forum. So beside our usual guests, uh, Dr. Tedros, WHO Director General, Sylvie Brian, who is our Director for Global Infectious Hazard Preparedness, and Mike Ryan, who is uh, WHO Executive Director for uh, Health Emergency Programs. We also have Dr. Marie Polkini that you may remember very well because she was with WHO for many years. She is a co-chair of the forum. And we also have Dr. Sumia Swaminathan, who is a WHO Chief Scientist. Um, before giving the floor to Dr. Tedros, just to remind everyone um, that we will have a uh, we will have an audio file and transcript from this press conference. Journalists are joining us online. If you are online, please uh, uh, click on raise hand on your screen if you want to be put in a queue for questions. For those who are dialing in by phone, please type star 9 and you will be put in a queue for questions. For those in the room, uh, very warm welcome. There are many new faces that we are seeing for the first time in WHO, so hope uh, you will have a good time uh, with us. And uh, again, to remind everyone, please, one question per journalist, so we give opportunity to as many as we can. And with that, I give the floor immediately to Dr. Tedros. Thank you. Thank you, Tariq. And Good afternoon, and we, of course we have uh, the many colleagues uh, from media based in Geneva, but we see more uh, today, and I understand this is because of the uh, conference uh, we're, we're, we're hosting. Uh, thank you so much for your uh, interest, and welcome everybody. Before I update you on the coronavirus uh, outbreak, I would like to start with a few words about Ebola. As you know, we have two fronts now. Uh, although the world is now focused on coronavirus, we cannot and must not forget Ebola. We are very encouraged by the current trend. There have only been three cases in the past week and no cases in the past three days. days. But until we have no cases for 42 days, it's not over. As you know, any single case could reignite the epidemic. And the security situation in Eastern DRC remains extremely fragile. So we take the progress on Ebola with, with caution, although it's a big success. And we are in still full response mode. Yesterday alone, we had 5,400 alerts that were investigated. Almost 300 samples were analyzed. More than 700 people were vaccinated, and almost 2,000 contacts were followed. So still, it's a massive response. And tomorrow, the Emergency Committee for Ebola will meet to assess whether the Ebola outbreak in DRC continues to constitute a public health emergency of international concern. So you will have more news tomorrow on Ebola. Regardless of their recommendation or the ISIS recommendation, the world needs to continue to fund the Ebola response. Taking our foot off the accelerator now could be a fatal mistake, quite literally. On Thursday, I will travel to Kinshasa for meetings with the President of DRC and other senior ministers to look beyond Ebola and sketch our ways to strengthen DRC's health system. And I would like to use this opportunity to appreciate the government's leadership. The current status of Ebola would not have been reached without the strong leadership by the government of DRC and the President, President Sikasidi himself. Now to coronavirus. First of all, we now have a name 
for the disease. And it is COVID-19, and I will spell it, C-O-V-I-D hyphen one nine. CO, CO stands for Corona, as you know. VI stands for virus, D for disease, so COVID. Under agreed guidelines between WHO, the World, uh, the World Health Organization, uh, the World Organization for Animal Health, and the Food and Agriculture Organization, means WHO, OIE, and FAO, of the United Nations, we had to find a name that did not refer to a geographical location, an animal, an, indiv an individual, or group of people, and which is also pronounceable and related to the disease. Having a name matters to prevent the use of other names that can be inaccurate or stigmatizing. It also gives us a standard format to use for any future coronavirus outbreaks. And now to the coronavirus situation. As of 6 a.m. Geneva time this morning, there were 42,708 confirmed cases reported in China. And tragically, we have now surpassed 1,000 deaths, 1,017. People in China have lost their lives to this virus. Most of the cases and most of the deaths are in Hubei province, Wuhan. Outside China, there are 393 cases in 24 countries and one death. Last week, I told you that we had engaged WHO's network of country representatives, as well as the United Nations resident coordinators in countries, to brief them on the outbreak and inform them about the steps they can take. I also briefed Secretary General Antonio Guterres, and we agreed to leverage the power of the entire UN system in the response. Today, we have also activated a UN crisis management team to be led by my general, Dr. Mike Ryan. This will help WHO focus on the health response while the other agencies can bring their expertise to bear on the wider social, economic, and developmental implications of the outbreak so we are all working to our strengths. So Mike will be the chief, still continue to be the chief emergency and will also coordinate the whole UN response. As you know, today and tomorrow WHO is hosting a meeting of more than 400 scientists from around the world, both in person and virtually. The main outcome we expect from this meeting is not immediate answers to every question that we have. The main outcome is an agreed roadmap on what questions we need to ask and how we will go about answering those questions. This is exactly what WHO is for, bringing the world together to coordinate the response. That's the essence of multilateralism, which is very important for the world. And a research roadmap is also important for organizations that fund research to have a clear sense of what the public health priorities are so they can make investments that deliver the biggest public health impact. The development of vaccines and therapeutics is one important part of the research agenda. But it's not only one part. They will take time to develop, but in the meantime, we are not defenseless. There are many basic public health interventions that are available to us now 
and which can prevent infections now. For instance, the first vaccine could be ready in 18 months. So we have to do everything today using the available weapon to fight this virus while preparing for the long term using the preparation for the vaccines. That's why we have sent supplies to countries to diagnose and treat patients and protect health workers. We have advised countries on how to prevent the spread of disease and care for those who are sick. We are strengthening the lab capacity all over the world. We are training thousands of health workers and we are keeping the public informed about what everyone can do to protect their own health and that of others. It's when each and every individual becomes part of the prevention and control, the containment strategy, that we can succeed. So that's why reaching out to the public directly and telling the public the kind of precautions they need to take. This could be clean, clean your hands regularly, either with alcohol-based drug or soap and water. Keep your distance from someone who is coughing or sneezing. And when you cough or sneeze, cover your mouth and nose with a tissue or your elbow. It's also important to remember that while we need investment in research and development, we also need investment in stopping this outbreak now. Last week, WHO issued a call for $675 million, which is what the world needs to support preparedness and response operations in countries. We thank those countries that have contributed so far and we call on all those who haven't to contribute urgently. There are many positive signals in terms of funding and we hope all these positive signals will materialize. If we invest now in rational and evidence-based interventions, we have a realistic chance of stopping this outbreak we have a window of opportunity. Maybe you have, you're tired of me saying window of opportunity, but there is a window of opportunity. If you see the number of cases in China and the rest of the world, it's not even comparable. More than 40,000 in China, while in the rest of the world, it's only in the 300s, and only one does. You strike hard, when the opportunity is there, when the window of opportunity is there. So that's what we are saying to the rest of the world. Let's be serious in using the window of opportunity we have. We shouldn't lose this opportunity. If we lose, we will regret it. And the opportunity was created because of the serious measures that China is taking in Wuhan and the other affected provinces. That is slowing the spread of the virus to the rest of the world. But I don't think this status can stay the same for long. That's why we have to use the current window of opportunity to hit hard and stand in unison to fight this virus in every corner. If we don't, we could have far more cases and far higher costs on our hands. And I don't think anybody wants that. This is a common enemy and we have to fight it using this window of opportunity and fight it hard. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tedros, for these opening remarks. So just to remind... Sorry, um, may I add one please, thing? Go ahead. <laughs> Some colleagues here, uh, including my colleague journalists, friends, were asking me, where is Maria? I didn't know Maria is so popular now. <laughs> so Maria Van Kerkove is part of the expert team, and she is in Beijing, and she is well, if you're worried. 
So uh, you will see her uh, virtually, if she's listening. And um, uh, just uh, for your information, so she's with uh, uh, Bruce in Beijing, and hopefully she's listening as uh, Bernard had, had, had said. But I'm very happy to see the respect you have for her. And I'm glad that, um, you know, I have a very strong team, which I'm really proud. They're working day and night, 24-7, round the clock, under stress, but really going with commitment and saying that we will not rest until this outbreak is over. So Maria is one of them, and thank you so much for reminding me to ask, for asking me where her whereabouts is. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tektos, and, and greetings to, to Dr. Van Kirchhoff, who is listening to us. Uh, before we start taking questions from the floor, again, to remind the journalists uh, online to uh, click uh, raise hand on the right side of their screen, and those dialing in by phone to press star nine. So we will start with the questions here. Well, gentlemen, just in front of me, then uh, Christian, then we will go on this side. Uh, please introduce yourself. Uh, and the outlet you are working for, and please, one short question. Thank you. Okay, uh, Yang, with Xinhua, 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 Xinhua News, News Agency. As, uh, As Dr. Tedros mentioned, mentioned, the entire UN system is willing to help. So could you give us a few examples on what the other agencies in the UN can contribute to the control and the prevention of the outbreak? Thank you so much. Yes, we have many uh, sister agencies. Uh, do I need to use this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, no. Okay. Okay. We have um, many important sister agencies in the, the United Nations system, uh, many of whom need good information in order to manage their day-to-day -day operations and business continuity. So our humanitarian partners, peacekeeping partners need to understand the virus like every other global business operation needs to understand what's happening with the virus. But there are many of our UN agencies like the International Maritime Organization, the International Civilization uh, Organization, who also can contribute huge amounts of information to our understanding and equally we work closely with them. We have uh, agencies like UNICEF uh, who are very important in risk communications and social stabilization and, and working in education and schools and, and in the healthcare system and on infection prevention and control. And we work very closely with our colleagues in UNICEF. Um, there are the agencies who work on humanitarian response and they obviously have a duty of care to refugees and to, to others and they need our inputs in terms of best practice uh, for, for themselves. Uh, and we have the financial institutions like the World Bank who are in a very strong position to look at the financial implications and shocks associated with this and look at means of mitigating uh, those, uh, those impacts. So the, the idea here is to bring together the UN system under the leadership of the SG with the Director General to ensure that the work WHO is doing is feeding into the UN system uh, in terms of its own business, but equally that uh, the UN uh, agencies who can contribute to the overall global effort are doing so. And in particular, I would make reference to the, the, our resident coordinators in country for the UN system who integrate all of the UN operations in country. Many countries with weaker health systems may also have uh, uh, weaknesses in their economies and other potential shocks uh, that might arise. So working, uh, our country representatives, WHO's country representatives, are working very, very closely with the resident coordinators of the UN system and uh, we intend to continue doing that and in fact uh, have had uh, large-scale teleconferences with all uh, resident coordinators in the world. Uh, I think uh, a couple of days ago we brought them all together last week. So I think that's the nature of the, uh, the crisis management team operation and this will be a joint operation between the United Nations Office for Crisis Coordination in New York and our Strategic, strategic Health Operations Center here at WHO in Geneva. Thank you very much, uh, Christian. Uh, for journalists, please press the use the mic. Yes, go ahead, please. Hello, this is Christiana with the German Press Agency and it's a question for Dr. Tedros. 
there are reports today that uh, the National Health Commission in China has changed the reporting rules of uh, cases, meaning that people who are confirmed to be infected with the virus but do not show symptoms are not being counted in the statistics. Have you heard about that and what is your response? Uh, I don't have that information, but we have regular uh, communication with them, so we will check that. And we have also people on the ground, so we will check and get back to you. Thank you. Very much. Uh, yes, please, here. And then uh, we will take a couple of more questions from the room here, because we have all journalists who travel to Geneva, so we will give a little bit of a priority to them. Uh, yes, please, go ahead. Uh, it has to be... Yes. Okay. Thank you, Tarek. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Xing from Xinhua News Agency. Uh, we've learned that there are also Chinese researchers attending today's forum in a virtual way. So to what extent may the experience of China's health workers and frontline and the collecting and sharing of data by the Chinese researcher help design uh, the roadmap of this research? Thank you. They actually have first-hand experience and a lot of experience and surely they will help. And not only that, they will significantly shape the roadmap. But I will ask my other colleagues also to, to comment, comment on this, but we expect a lot from them. Just to add, um, we were very fortunate this morning to have both Dr. George Gao and Dr. Wu from the China CDC uh, connected online, and they presented the data, particularly the research that has already been initiated in China and we also have participants who are going to stay with us throughout uh, the two days and it's essential that they are involved in every aspect of the planning of the research since most of the, the cases are in China now so it would be critical for Chinese scientists and doctors and researchers to be involved. Uh, Dr. Kini, do you want to add something? Well, also to say that there have been a lot of preparation from the WHO colleagues for this forum and that uh, thematic group have met virtually through teleconferences and as much as possible, as much as they were available because they have other uh, things to deal with right now, but the Chinese scientists have been involved in this discussion and, and we certainly hope that they will continue to be engaged in, uh, in uh, in drafting, in, in setting this, this roadmap. We also have had the opportunity to have vaccine manufacturers from China uh, participate in, in uh, today's meeting. And Sylvie has more uh, information on the question you asked, so please, Sylvie. Sure, sure. So yes, we, we ask our colleagues uh, in the field uh, uh, about those changes of case definition, and indeed it's normal to adapt the case definition to the reality. So um, uh, recently they have uh, done the fourth adaptation to include uh, mild cases and asymptomatic cases. And so if asymptomatic cases become positive uh, uh, at the laboratory testing, then they include them into the confirmed cases uh, number. And so uh, they have indeed uh, uh, broadened the case definition because before uh, the testing was only done on people who were uh, hospitalized or attending uh, some uh, um, <coughs> uh, medical attention, receiving medical attention, but now uh, because they are following contacts, uh, apparently they have uh, also included some asymptomatic people, they are follow followed up or post-symptomatic because uh, in the contact list. So including the mild and the asymptomatic actually is a good idea. It's good. It's good that they did that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much for clarifying this. Uh, now let's take a few more from the room. Well, let's try our colleagues who travel to Geneva to be with us here. So I'll start with uh, Victoria, then Tom, then John, please. Donald from Channel 4 News in London. Um, there have been reports of a Chinese national in Burkina Faso who's been t uh, tested for coronavirus um, and as we speak we're told that there is a Chinese, China Embassy, WHO and Burkina Faso Ministry of Health press conference. Can you tell us anything about what would be the first reported case uh, in Africa? So we, we, we don't have that information. Um, 
We had some suspected cases in three or four countries, which were all negative, but the Burkina Faso is something new with which, which we haven't heard about, and we will, we will follow up on that. Thank you. Uh, please. You rightly mentioned the window of opportunity. As time passes, are you becoming more or less confident that this virus can be contained? As time passes, um, my confidence will depend on how, you know, the strengths of measures we, we, we take. And that's why we're asking countries to be as, um, you know, aggressive as possible in or because we are still in containment strategy and we shouldn't allow this virus to have a space uh, to have local uh, transmission so it depends we may <laughs> you know uh, miss or squander this opportunity or use this opportunity and I'm saying we still have time and let's not squander this opportunity there is opportunity, window of opportunity that we can use still, still now. There is, there is, and there should be strong leadership, strong coordination, and they have really uh, should do all the things, all take all the measures they need to contain it. Thank you very much, uh, please. There we go. Um, so uh, there is a cruise ship, the Westerdam Luxury Liner, which has been unable to uh, dock. It's been turned away from multiple ports. Um, uh, given your guidance on travel, uh, do you have any message about that? And have you um, talked with any of the countries that have refused uh, uh, docking um, to this uh, Westerdam cruise ship? Um, we're in uh, daily discussions as we speak with the International Maritime Organization who, uh, who deal with uh, these matters and my colleague here, Jawad Major, to my left, uh, our Assistant Director General for Preparedness has been leading those uh, discussions um, and uh, we've been looking at a number of different ships, mainly cargo vessels and not necessarily cruise liners. Um, it's really important that there's an appropriate risk management approach taken here. Uh, and that, uh, that also state parties be reminded of their obligations under what IMO terms free practique, which is the ability for uh, ships to dock unimpeded, especially to unload cargo, and uh, also reminding our state parties of the principles of the dignity and human rights of travellers, which the IN, IHR also enshrines. Uh, there are uh, manageable risks associated with the conveyances and there's plenty of guidance on how to do this properly. We need to ensure that there's neither an overreaction or uh, an underreaction and uh, uh, we need a proper risk management approach to this as we want to see to all types of gatherings uh, and we're going to have this more and more in the coming weeks as we see more events and conferences and we see uh, cruise ships anywhere where people come and congregate there's always going to be concern. But we need to balance those concerns with the need for our society, civilization, our economies to move. So we need to take a risk management approach. We must accept that in these circumstances there is no such thing as a zero risk. We must minimize risks, we must protect people and be ready to react appropriately should something uh, untoward or something unexpected happen. Uh, and in the same exact case of cruise ships, again, a proper risk management approach to dealing with this issue is what we're advising. And uh, as I say, we will be uh, further analyzing the number of ships who are in uh, this particular circumstance and we'll have more data on that tomorrow. But again, we call for the normal obligations under free practique and for the normal principles of the dignity and human rights of travelers to be upheld. Thank you very much, Dr. Ryan. We will take one more from here, from uh, Tulip, uh, who came from BBC here, and then we will go online. Tulip.
Yeah. Thank you. Um, maybe you must be tired of me saying for some time now, since I became DG, many journalists just asked me, what's your, uh, what wakes you, what, what wakes you up at night? And I say, pandemic flu and any, any pandemic disease. Um, and the reason for that is exactly what you say, because we have countries with weaker health systems. And as you know, we're as strong as the weakest link. And the world is getting smaller and smaller. It's a globalized world. And whatever happens at the weakest link could affect all of us. So that's why when we think about investing in our respective health systems, we should not forget to invest in countries, weaker health systems that need support. So my message again in the middle of this outbreak is the same. We have to invest in preparedness. And preparedness means helping those countries who need a helping hand to strengthen their health system. And that's going to be our guarantee. And we have identified, by the way, as WHO, the minimum is 30 countries. If you push to the maximum, are not more than 45 countries who need our support. And investing in those countries with weaker health systems is important. I think we're now having a real problem in our hands. And we must take what's happening now seriously and really commit to preparedness, to strengthening our health systems all over the world and make this world safer. Still, I said it many times, I have a great concern that if this virus makes it to a weaker health system, it will create havoc. It will. For now, it doesn't seem so. But it doesn't mean that it will not happen. It may. It depends on how really we lead this response and how, how we respond to uh, the outbreak. So that's why I don't think it's too late. We have the window of opportunity and the whole world should really stand in unison to contribute to strengthening the countries with weaker health systems. And that's the answer for now. But that's not just for now. But we have to continue. This is not a few months or a few years of work. It will be many years of work that should be sustained and make our health system as strong as possible. Because we have already seen it. Outbreaks can bring serious upheavals, serious consequences to the world. It's not just a health security issue, or it's not a matter of somebody sick or, you know, the number of people who are dead. It's a matter of political, social, and economic upheavals. It can affect all, all areas of society. And that's why we have to take it seriously. You know, the world, when, it's, when it talks about terrorism, and imagine the level of preparation and so on, is, is immense. To be honest, a virus is more powerful in creating political, economic, and social upheaval than any terrorist attack, believe it or not. I was a foreign minister, been one of my heart discussing about terrorism and, and so on, but a virus can have more powerful consequences than any terrorist action. And that's true. And if the world doesn't want to wake up and consider this enemy virus as public enemy number one, I don't think we will learn from our lessons. It's number one enemy, and to the whole world. 
and to the whole humanity. And that's why we have to do everything to invest in health systems, to invest in preparedness. And that's why I always say that's what wakes me up at night. And it should wake all of us at night. It's the worst enemy you can imagine. It can create havoc, political, economic, and social. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tarius. We will go for a few questions from journalists online and hope if we are all short, we will be able to get back to the room. Uh, I'll call first to colleagues from CNN. Uh, uh, Vasco, can, can you hear us, please? is on uh, comments made by a doctor in uh, Hong Kong today who said that this virus could reach up to 60% of the world population. What, what do you have to say on that? The, someone from Hong Kong who said that this virus could reach 60% of the world population. Yeah, if, if, if fires are left unchecked, they can burn down a lot of the forest, and one can speculate uh, how far a fire like this can burn. Uh, I, I think we, as the DG said, when we look at disease outside China, we're dealing with less than 400 cases in 24 countries in over a month of transmission. Now, that does not mean that that won't escalate. It doesn't mean that that won't accelerate. That is not, in that sense, an, un, an insurmountable problem. We have the unknowns about period of transmissibility. We have the unknowns about mild cases. But what the data is telling us that we still have an opportunity. We have the opportunity to contain, to confine, to slow down, to prepare. And we need to be extremely careful uh, not to overly... Um, Everyone is talking about social media. Everyone is talking about staying calm and keeping our populations calm. Yet every chance we get... We seem like we want to accelerate the infodemic and not contain the epidemic. So I think we need to be very balanced and careful here with our populations, with our communities. They already have concerns, and they're concerned. And the real issue is to empower our communities to take action, to protect themselves, to give them things to do. And there are things that every single human being on this planet can do to protect themselves from this disease. So let's be careful in throwing around figures, speculation, and scaring people. Uh, let's, let us plan and focus, laser focus, on containment, confinement, and slowing the virus down. And if we have to deal with the circumstances, uh, at a later date of a more widespread epidemic, we, we will do that. Uh, and, <clears throat> and that could be a milder disease at that point. So we just, I just caution everybody to, to not start throwing around figures that there is no basis for at the moment. I will maybe add to that. Yeah, just to remind you one thing. When Ebola started, if you remember, there was a lot of speculation, and there were some people were saying it will really move or spread all over the world. Uh, this is going to be dangerous, and, um, and estimates speculation after speculation. And our position was, okay, expecting the worst may be fine, but let's see what we can do. And we said, as WHO, containment is possible. So let's not just go into extremes. And you remember, we were actually being attacked for advocating for containment, keeping this virus, Ebola, in DRC, and finally finish it. And you remember that. And what happened now? A year and a half, it's contained in DRC. You remember it crossed to Uganda, three, four cases, and it was hammered because Uganda was prepared. It's still contained in the RC. There were speculations. There could be speculations. And I don't mind with speculations, but let's have also the balance. What can we do within our hand to really contain this outbreak? And the strategy, by the way, with what we're using now is the same. Hammer the source. Hammer the epicenter. Slow or prevent the spread of that virus to the rest of the world. 
And that was exactly what, was do what we were trying to do in DRC. So we don't want that WHO go into speculations. We prefer actually, okay, people can have projections, that we prefer what can be done with the equipment or with the solutions at hand and do our best to contain it at the source without undermining its gravity, without undermining the serious consequences it may have. And that's what we did, and that's what we want for this one. Of course, Ebola and this are not the same. Ebola is lousy. This is airborne. Corona is airborne. It's more contagious. And you have seen it, how it went into 24 countries, although it's a small number of cases. In terms of potential to wreak havoc, the corona is very different from Ebola. Corona has more potency, virulence. We take it more seriously, but still the position should be, instead of speculation, really to focus at the source, to do everything at the source, slow the spread, support, stop the spread, invest more in containment, and based on the situation, move into other strategies if necessary. So meaning we have to be realistic. We have to be calm. But we have to take also serious measures. That's what we advise. And many of the instruments to check it are in our hands. But we can expect, of course, serious things, but let's do whatever we can and contain it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tedros. Uh, let's take one more question from line. Uh, John Cohen from Science. John, can you hear us? Uh, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, do you hear me? Yes. Um, so can you quickly clarify what the virus name is? You said the disease name. And also, have you received any information from China about the environment or sample, environmental samples tested at the marketplace and whether any animals were tested? Do you have any details at all? This is the disease, it's not the virus. Yeah, but it's the disease name. Yes, COVID-19. Do you want to? You can move out. So, so the name of the disease is is COVID-19, that's coronavirus disease 19. And the reason for choosing the name, I think the Director General pointed out what certain principles are when you name the disease. Um, coronavirus um, is a group of viruses that's quite common. There are already many known uh, human strains of corona and many, many animal strains of corona. So it is possible that in the future there will be another strain of coronavirus and then that could be uh, also named uh, by the year in which it <coughs> appeared. So it, it allows for future naming of corona, other coronaviruses. And at the same time, this disease also allows um, the entire spectrum of clinical manifestations to be, to be covered. It is uh, because it's a respiratory, it could also manifest in other forms, and so it's a, it's a broader name. The virus itself uh, is named by the international group of uh, virologists who will look into the um, taxonomy. There's a particular taxonomy that uh, they follow and then the, the genus, the species, etc. Would be, would be specified. But it's important to have a, a name uh, for this disease that everybody uses. Um, both for scientific purposes to compare, when you want to compare the literature, you want to compare data, you need a common terminology and also to avoid a number of different stigmatizing or other forms of uh, confusing names. Thank you very much. Uh, I think there was another question, Sylvie. Okay. Yes, we, we have received um, information on, on the 
animal source of this virus. So uh, from the uh, first genetic sequences that was uh, uh, put on the web and, and, and publicly available to scientists, uh, uh, some scientists have done some phylogenetic studies and they have uh, identified that this virus is very similar to a virus that is uh, uh, a coronavirus that can be found in bats. Uh, but uh, when they did some uh, sampling in the Wuhan seafood market, they didn't find uh, so many bats. And so uh, it's very likely that there is an intermediate host uh, that has been contaminated, and, uh, but still they have done a lot of samples in uh, various uh, animal species, but they have not found yet which intermediate host could have been uh, the amplifier, at least uh, in this uh, uh, Wuhan city. So um, studies are ongoing because they are checking a number of animal species, so it takes some time. Uh, what they have done as well is they have tested a number of environmental samples on surfaces and, and uh, different places in the market. And so they have found indeed uh, the coronavirus uh, that is now responsible of this epidemic in human. So uh, there was some environmental contamination probably also at the beginning of this outbreak. Now this market has been closed, has been disinfected, and so uh, this environmental contamination doesn't exist anymore. But studies are still ongoing to try to better understand what has happened in the animal world before uh, human beings were contaminated. And it's still ongoing and we hope that this uh, meeting on research will provide us uh, a little bit more information on this aspect of the outbreak that is still uh, not very clear and, and requires more research. Okay, sorry, I, will, I, I use the military word airborne. It meant to spread via droplets or respiratory transmission. Please take it that way, not the military language. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much for, for clarification. Uh, we will go back to the room as I have some questions. We'll start with Body, then Stephanie, then Gunilla. Very short, one question, please. Um, I'm still, uh, the, the host, uh, which we have to protect the first country and we have to support the first country. We understand that. It's for, for example, the priority focus on the epicenter where the disease is existing. So, um, could you tell us more about the next uh, guide map on the epicenter uh, about the science and uh, uh, pharmacology? What should be done in the epicenter of the outbreak? Next. Other than what's being done now. Um, I think, um, uh, well, certainly from our observations and from working with authorities in China, uh, they've been heavily focused on, on two issues, three issues, I think. Uh, Wuhan and Hubei itself, the surrounding or the provinces who have been more heavily affected than others and they've sort of had a three-pronged approach and you can see the way they've had very strong measures in Wuhan but they've extended those measures to defined areas outside Wuhan where they feel the epidemiology was getting uh, more difficult or more challenging. So they're operating sort of, I believe, on sort of a three-pronged uh, strategy. Um, uh, the, the you can see over the last uh, <coughs> number of days <coughs> and weeks that uh, the initial focus was clearly on caring for the sick and really dealing with that shock to the system of so many unwell people presenting and you saw that with the efforts to build new uh, isolation facilities. But increasingly what we're seeing is the community at large, community committees and the mobilization of community-based surveillance, community-based activity uh, in order to detect milder cases and you can see by the way the case definition is being shifted now the, there's a move now to move out and trying to detect all of cases even the milder cases and, and that seems like a very prudent thing because you want to check that you're seeing all the cases when you're fa facing a fire a large fire and this happened in West Africa too with Ebola in, when the disease was extremely intense 
it's very hard to do this, the classic public health things like contact tracing. You're dealing with a massive wave of cases, you're trying to deal with the sick, and as you get control on that, and as the number of very sick patients drops or stabilizes, you try to push the surveillance out towards the community, you try to detect more and more of the cases. That's if you're still focusing on containment as your approach, because you want to try and break the chains of transmission. So we believe China <coughs> is really pushing the surveillance into the community. It's an attempt to try and shut down transmission. We've said it before, neither they nor we are sure that that will work because the virus has its own characteristics in terms of its period of transmission or asymptomatic uh, people being able to transmit. But they're making an attempt now to push surveillance further and further out into the community and see if we can shut down the virus. There is no guarantee of that. So that's what we're seeing in terms of the shift. And our team in, in, in China is working closely with uh, with Chinese authorities and scientists to, to look at that. I think the other part of this will be having a much better understanding of the clinical severity and on the clinical picture because if the disease were to spread uh, further in the world and if we see more cases in the world, the clinical techniques and the clinical information and the clinical knowledge that's been gained in China right now will be absolutely central to the successful treatment of patients elsewhere in the world. So that's another vital gift to the world. So again, pulling that information together in a systematic way, gathering systematic clinical data now, not just reports, not just anecdotes, but systematic clinical information is absolutely central to success. So all of the activities are aimed at containment, but all of those activities will support uh, a broader mitigation effort should the virus uh, continue to spread uh, in other parts of the world. and clinical trials, sorry, uh, <laughs> Sylvie reminded me that uh, right now with the caseload in China, while it's very terrible toll, and again, we recognize the work of the health workers and the suffering of communities and families in China. Uh, they're suffering uh, on behalf of us all. Um, but there is an opportunity to test drugs, and already at least one clinical trial is underway, and we're working with uh, Chinese uh, scientists on further clinical trials that will allow the immediate testing of drugs in that setting and the results again of those trials will be available in time to guide clinicians in other parts of the world. So again that's another important strand and again a further and complete understanding of the source. As I said uh, a presumption of the source is a dangerous thing because even if we were successful in this attempt to confine and contain the virus if we don't know the source then we're equally vulnerable in future to a similar outbreak and understanding that source uh, is a very important uh, next step in the strategy. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, some of our speakers have to go, so we'll take super short two questions that I promised to, uh, to Stephanie and to Gunilla. So very short because we have to go. We will have uh, other opportunities already tomorrow. We'll be here. Stephanie. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, I just wondered, um, the Director General, in your speech, you referred to a very grave threat. Uh, potentially to the rest of the world from this virus, which is clearly an emergency in China. Um, I wondered if you could elaborate on that, especially for our visual colleagues, and what led you to use that language uh, this morning? Uh, was there some assess change in your risk assessment overnight? Was it um, information coming in from Hong Kong about suspect cases in a building which was later dismissed uh, on the basis of results? Could you elaborate? No, um, it's the issue is about the use of the window of opportunity. We have a window of opportunity now for the rest of the world. We see what's happening in China in terms of the number of cases and fatality. So if we don't use the window of opportunity we have now, if we don't operate with a sense of urgency, there could be a serious consequence. That's what I meant to say. And I'm reminding the world to use this opportunity to do whatever it can to contain this uh, outbreak. Do everything it can. And there is time. Because as I said, the number of cases in the rest of the world is less than 400, and there is only one death. That's a window of opportunity. So I'm reminding, there is time, the time is ticking. 
And time is the essence in this outbreak. And the virus will not sleep and wait. We cannot sleep. So we have to operate with a sense of urgency and with strong political commitment throughout the world. And then we can beat this outbreak. If not, then the other side will happen. So that's why. I'm just, I was reminding this morning, I remind now, I will continue to remind until the world really takes this seriously, do it with sense of urgency, and believes from the heart that the time is the essence. Time is the essence. Now. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Last question, Gunilla, and then we will uh, conclude. Very short, please. Yes, hello, Gunilla von Hall, Swedish Svenska Dagbladet. I have a question about the British man who obviously uh, infected 11 people while he traveled uh, across the world. Um, what does this tell you, this case? Does it tell you that the virus is changing in any way, it's mutating? And uh, how can countries prepare for these kind of cases and this kind of spread? So my colleagues will say more, but that's why we're saying time is the essence, because mutation is another issue. <laughs> Crosses every host, then you know what happens, and everybody knows. So that's why we say time is the essence again, but I would be happy if our colleagues could, could say and mutation be one of them. Yeah. I, <clears throat> I really wish we could refrain from personalizing these issues down to individuals who spread disease. This is deeply, deeply unhelpful. These are very unfortunate events in which families and others are wrapped up in, friends and others. There are circumstances that allow disease to transmit. People are not at fault. They are never at fault in this situation. So let's be extremely careful here. It's really, really important that we don't attach unnecessary stigma to this. This is an unfortunate event, and there are circumstances around the way in which disease may have been transmitted, uh, and, uh, and there may be other clusters like that. This is by no means, and compared to other events, a massive super-spreading event. This is uh, uh, an unusual event, <clears throat> and it is a wake-up call, because there may be other circumstances in which this disease can spread like this, and we need to study those circumstances for sure. But it doesn't change our overall assessment. <clears throat> and again, I cast your minds back to SARS. <clears throat> when we had the Metropole Hotel, everyone said, it's all over. It's global now. And then we had the Amoy Gardens, and everyone said, it's all over. It's in these buildings, and that's it. We can't be stopped, right? And, we, and it's important that we stop when we have those events, uh, the cruise ship issue in, in, in Japan at the moment. And these unusual <coughs> events offer an opportunity to study the virus, but none of them individually change the overall risk assessment. But you take them all together, and that change your risk assessment over time. So we just need to be careful to study these types of situations, understand more from them what's happening, and if overall, through a series of those events, we see a dynamic shift in the virus, then we will tell you uh, openly and transparently that we see that. At the moment, we don't see that. Thank you very much. We will conclude here. Thanks to everyone watching us online, dialing in by phone, watching us on our Twitter account. We will have audio file very shortly and transcript uh, likely tomorrow morning posted on our website uh, regarding tomorrow press conference uh, on uh, emergency committee on Ebola outbreak in DRC and the end of uh, uh, research forum. We will send a note uh, either tonight or tomorrow morning. So thank you for being with us and have a nice day.